And this year it is our great privilege to have Dr. Paul Changha Lim as the second Joseph Tang Reformed Theology Lecturer. He's a dear colleague of mine whom I met uh, when both of us were studying at Princeton Theological Seminary. And then he went on to uh, Cambridge to pursue his PhD. And uh, since then we kept in touch and I appreciated and admired his scholarship and his commitment to the church. Dr. Paul Chang is an award-winning historian with particular focus on historical manifestations of the reformations in the British Atlantic world. His book, Mystery Unveiled, The Crisis of the Trinity in Early Modern England, published by Oxford in 2012, won the Roland H. Bainton Prize as the best book in history or theology by the 16th Century Society and Conference in 2013. He has also written two other books, including The Cambridge Companion to Puritanism, published in 2008, which he co-edited with John Hopi, and in pursuit of purity, unity, and liberty, Richard Baxter's Puritan theology in its 17th century context, published by Brill in 2004. He is wrapping up research and writing on another book, this time dealing with debates on the identity of Jesus Christ in Enlightenment in England. His research has been sponsored by fellowships from the Luce Foundation, the Fulbright Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., the Louisville Institute, the Archbishop Cranmer, Cranmer Fund from Cambridge University, the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, the Lilly Faculty Grant, and the Vanderbilt University Research Scholars Grant. He's also a popular speaker and a YouTube star. He has a video uh, he uh, shares about his testimony uh, at a conference, and this video went viral, and uh, his hit about 2 million viewers so far and counting and, and growing closer to the Lord of all truth, goodness, and beauty. Uh, he's not new to ITS. Uh, he was a visiting professor many years ago, and he's back here now as our second Dr. Joseph Tong Reform Theology Lecturer. Let us warmly welcome Dr. Paul Lim. Well, thank you so much. It's a wonderful delight and a great honor to be here with you today. Um, I was fighting back tears, actually, because the last time I was here, your school was in L.A., and I taught a course, modular course, at Calvin's Institute, as I recall. And it was while Dr. Professor Joel King, who is now the president of the Presbyterian Center of Presbyterian Hill, and also Dr. Joseph Clark was on faculty. And I learned a lot from that experience and encounter and environment. And I hope that you will the same during my stay here both today and tomorrow. Um, so um, I am uh, trained as a historian of Christianity, particular attention to post-Reformation England and the kind of manifestations and impact and consequences of English Calvinism, aka Puritanism. And so I've been meddling about that since about 1995, I suppose. So uh, that's when I met uh, President Lee at Princeton Seminary. And ever since then, that's been my uh, scholarly passion. But I'm also uh, very interested in making sense of the gospel uh, in our contemporary context. So with this uh, lecture today, uh, we're going to uh, visit a figure that's very well known to a lot of you, uh, John Calvin. And we'll also talk about how his life as a refugee impacted the way that he thought about his own identity, but also identity of all Christians then and now and much before in the times of Jesus. And also we'll talk about the least among us, at least socioeconomically, that is the poor. And we'll talk about human rights from the perspective of reform theology and the notions of the human day, the image of God um, created, uh, that we are all or with that Milago within all of us. I should hasten to add one more word of uh, gratitude. 
uh, to all who invited me here the second time here at ITS. I also taught at a school in Indonesia. I think that church is uh, run by Dr. Joseph Tong's brother. Yeah. Uh, what's his name? Yeah. Stephen Tong. Yeah. Stephen Tong. Yeah. 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 And he has a seminary. And I, I remember teaching there a few years ago and was really quite taken aback by the zeal that the students had to learn, but particularly about the full theology. So um, here we go. Right. So um, what we are planning to do uh, normally is I will lecture or uh, present for about 45 to 50 minutes. And then I would love to open it up for a Q&A or we can engage in a conversation. And as Dr. Lee mentioned, that I, I teach these Vanderbilt classes at this National Security Prison. This semester, I'm teaching a class called God and Human Suffering in Christian Traditions uh, at this Tennessee Women's Prison. And again, Vanderbilt students, about 13 of them, go to prison with me every Tuesday afternoon, where you basically have to kind of say goodbye to your civil liberties for the next four hours. And then we're reading text by Augustine, Irenaeus, uh, Shishato Endo, and so on and so forth, including John Calvin. They read John Calvin's sermon on Job uh, just a couple of weeks ago. Um, but all of that to say that there are different sites of learning and engaging in our task of learning and teaching. And I think it is um, here is no different. Um, and so I'm eager to learn a lot from you all as well. Uh, Heiko Obermann was a Dutch uh, scholar who spent the majority of his teaching career in Germany and then in the US, both at Harvard and also at the University of Arizona. Uh, he spoke of the Protestant Reformation as a refugee movement. And people have kind of opined and weighed in on this issue for some time now. That the Reformation needs to be seen as a as a cause and effect of much transmigration, all because of religious and political reasons. And so we need to kind of think of it that way. And I think hopefully this is not anything new. So religious conditions leading to a mass migration and refugee seeking. So in the 16th century, it is because of religion, and in 21st century, it may be uh, more to do with politics, but also religion is not uh, a non-factor either. So John Calvin is someone who is probably not in great need of introduction in this particular context, having lived between 1509 to 64. He left France at, at age uh, 26 as a refugee, and never got to go home. I mean, you know, when you come, when you came to America, I don't know how, how many years ago, or when you're born here, or whatever the case may be, I don't know what you're thinking that I'm going to be here at this particular time for a, a long time or a short while. So Calvin, when he left France, I don't think he actually planned to be, uh, uh, you know, pastoring. He wasn't thinking about becoming a pastor, first of all, and he was certainly not thinking about living in Geneva for a long time because he was actually en route to Basel and he was going to stay overnight, and then he gets this uh, pastor named Guillaume Farrell, basically, you know, kind of uh, said, if you actually don't stay here and work with us in this new kind of a religious movement called, you know, Protestant Reformation or Evangelicalism, God's going to curse you. And as a result of that fear, he ended up staying in Geneva. And then after about two, three years, he gets kicked out of the church because he was a little bit too much of a rigorist or too disciplinarian. So he then goes to Strasbourg, pastors at a French-speaking church. It was a German-speaking area. So if you are familiar with immigrant church context and so on, you are actually in good company. John Calvin was actually, for a while, for about three years, he was in Strasbourg. And then the church in Geneva called him back and said, come back because we couldn't think of anyone better than you. So then he came in. And so it, there, it humanizes this figure that is often seen as an austere figure. Um, and so he then kind of, throughout his life and in a lot of his biblical commentaries as well as sermons, saw the identity of the Christian as a stranger and an alien and the trajectory of the Christian journey as a sojourner. We're on route, we're going somewhere. We're already belonging to the city of God, but also the city of God is not yet completed. And as such, we are actually in this kind of peregrination or on our journey together. This is one of the, the, the portraits of Calvin. And this is the, the city crest. It's um, uh, post tenebras looks, which means after darkness, light. So the city of Geneva adopts 
evangelical Protestantism or Protestantism as this new mode of relating with God and worshiping God. So moving away from Catholicism to a new mode of religiosity called Protestantism. And it's, they kind of saw it as a sort of a, a, a period of enlightenment in a way, right? After darkness, you see light. And so, and that's what we have here. And this is a picture of this Ojibwe uh, Calhoun. So uh, perhaps, as we mentioned, that uh, the Protestant Reformation was in many ways a refugee movement. So both in, in Zurich, as well as in Frankfurt, Germany, as well as in Emden, the Netherlands, Geneva also was a host to a lot of these foreign language speaking churches. Right? So then there was an English speaking church. And so this is located uh, kind of not far from St. Peter's Cathedral where Calvin was the pastor because Geneva being a Francophone city, French speaking city, um, he was able to do his work, but then this was a place where the English speaking congregation was. And I visited it in 2005. Um, it's, um, and this is a, a inside of the Oritoa de Calvin. And uh, this is me back in 2005, so that's about 19 years ago. I had a lot more hair and more youthful looking. And so this gentleman was one of the elders, and he was the, the, the priest or the pastor of the English-speaking church uh, that met at Auditoire de Calvin. And so as a reformed theologian and a pastor, to me, one of my kind of uh, highlights as a reformed pastor was to preach uh, in the city of Calvin and in a, in a, in a church that Calvin thought very, very uh, highly of in terms of really seeing the refugees really meeting for Christian worship and having the freedom to worship God without fear of retaliation. And this is the Reformers' Wall. Um, it's, uh, it's Calvin is Calvin is there. No, Calvin is here, and then it's Knox and Forel and somebody else that I, I should know. <laughs> I knew that would happen. So, um, and that little baby was uh, less than a year old. He's now a college student here in this great state of California. So, all right. So, what, what I want to then, with this sort of an uh, autobiographical or kind of biographical background of Calvin and also how I kind of came across Calvin, um, I was, um, I, when I went to Princeton Seminary, I was uh, uh, studying with this uh, very, very well known Calvin specialist by the name of Jane Dempsey Douglas. And she encouraged me to actually go to Geneva. I don't know if you knew that, but, like, but then it was a toss up between Geneva and Edinburgh and, and Cambridge. Um, and then I ended up going to Cambridge, partly because I would have to do my uh, uh, doctoral dissertation in French. Um, and I was like, I'm by French isn't really that great. So, but Professor Douglas was really encouraging me to go study with the late Professor Irena Bacchus. Um, and uh, she was a really, really great, great scholar. But so anyway, so Calvin is someone that I've kind of studied uh, in, in, in various aspects. Have taught his uh, about a lot of different of his writings, of uh, uh, sermons, as well as institutes, as well as biblical commentaries in various settings, ranging from a local church, a PCA church, uh, to a Korean American uh, diaspora church uh, here in in Philadelphia or Nashville or other places here at ITS. So he's a, uh, a figure and a Christian brother who's uh, uh, with the Lord, whose ministry has meant a lot to me. And I think one of the things that has really kind of related to me deeply was that he was a refugee, that he knew something about this whole diaspora movement, how religious convictions or political convictions would expel you from your homeland. As my, my father himself was a political prisoner in South Korea, so when my family moved here when I was 15, it was primarily because of the fact that the South Korean government wanted to make sure that dissidents like my mom and dad could not stay and nor uh, their children. So um, there's a lot of overlap existentially and intellectually and theologically as well for me. I feel like this is a brother that I learned a lot from and engage in conversations with him now. So here's something that I may or may not be familiar to you. Um, his theology or doctrine of the Imago Dei. What he's doing in, in, in Book 3, Chapter 7, Section 6, uh, this is a quote from it. Uh, basically, what he's doing is um, he's kind of making a, a claim or, or uh, making a, a very strong claim that the universality of the Imago Dei really obliges us to really extend the, 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 the embrace of welcome to anyone that we see. 
And so let's unpack this, and this is how I normally teach. I like to take a chunk of a passage and then kind of work, uh, exegete it together with, with the class or with friends. So love of neighbor is not dependent upon man or friend, but looks to God. So, yes, so loving neighbor, loving whoever my neighbor is, our next door neighbor or, you know, different neighbors, is not predicated on whether that somebody is worth my time, but it actually looks to God. So it's not, a, it's not based upon the manner of humans or men, but looks to God. Therefore, the, thus the Lord commands all human beings without exception to do good, that you're actually obligated by divine fiat and command to do good to everybody. Yeah, and this is where his uh, utter realism, Augustinian or Calvinian realism, kicks in. That's a great part of them are most unworthy if they be judged by their own merit. So he says, okay, if I actually look at you know who they are, where they are coming from, and whether they're actually well prepared for this kind of exchange, he says, to be honest, most of them are unworthy of it. And some people get offended by it, but please don't get offended yet, okay? Because here the scripture helps in the best way when it teaches that we are not to consider that man's married of themselves, but look upon the image of God within all men, to which we owe all honor and love. Huh, this is a very, very strong claim he's making. So we are not to consider whether somebody deserves my embrace, my, my hospitality, my kindness, my generosity. Let's not think about that, he says. And instead, we have to think about the fact that we bear the imago, the image of God, for all, regardless of culture, regardless of col uh, color, regardless of creed even, the fact that we are all created in the image of God is a universal claim that God can make upon all human beings, then and now and future, and you see what I mean. And I think that is a very, very, very strong claim, and, and I've written about this uh, a few years ago, and, and every time I teach Calvin, uh, I teach at Vanderbilt University of Divinity School, which is a very, very different place, from ITS LA. It's a very progressive place. That means that most people, when they hear the name Calvin, they don't want to learn anything from Calvin. Like, oh, that guy's like predestination, you know, like Jesus, whatever. Everything bad about Western civilization actually came from him. But let me add you a very interesting anecdote. So I was a, a summer, I, I went to the University of Geneva um, for a summer school when I was a graduate student in, in England. And so we were there for about a, a four week intensive. Uh, uh, Reformation Studies course taught by the late professor Ivan Abakas. And so we were kind of having a dinner and, and you know, evening out. And then we're coming back on a taxi, me and, and I and about three other friends. And I forgot who asked, but then we asked this Algerian taxi driver as to why the city of Geneva seems so dead. It doesn't seem like a party town and whatever. And you know what they said? I mean, what the taxi driver said is, say Monsieur Calvin. It's Mr. Calvin's fault that the city is so <laughs> So even after like many, many centuries, the, the, the North African taxi driver, who's not from Geneva, he says, actually had learned something enough that, okay, the, the reason why the city is such a, you know, not a great party town is because of the influence of John Calvin. Well, put it this way, that sentiment is transported over to North America in Nashville, Tennessee, where I teach something about Calvin students want to listen. And this is how I normally approach it. I have them read this passage without telling them, without any kind of attribution of authorship. And they're usually surprised. They're like, wow, this is amazing, right? And then it says, okay, and, and then it says, therefore, whatever person you meet needs your help, you have no reason to refuse to help him. Say he's a stranger, but the Lord has given him a mark that ought to be familiar to you by virtue of the fact that God forbids you to despise your own flesh. So what he's talking about is a fundamental solidarity among, among all human beings, right? And say she's contemplative and worthless, but the Lord shows her to be one to whom God is designed to give the beauty of his image. So whenever I, students read it, they're blown away, like, oh, this is wonderful. And they would ask, like, who wrote this? And I said, well, his initials are J.C. You know, Jesus Christ, I said, well, <laughs> Jesus, as far as I know, never wrote anything. <laughs> And when I tell them this John Calvin, everybody's surprised. They're like, no, he couldn't have done it. And some gets even upset, like he could have written that because he's a horrible man. I said, horrible or not, he didn't write this. Okay? I mean, I, I, I don't want to take anything away from one's authorship. He wrote this. And then someone said, well, he's a hypocrite. I said, aren't we all? Aren't we all? Isn't there, isn't there, you know, I mean, one of the biggest lessons I've learned in my life, I learned it in this London uh, subway station. 
You know, if you go to a London subway station, as the door opens, they will have this voice that tell you what? Mind the, gap. mind the gap. Thank you very much, doctor. That's right. Mind the gap. Those three words. Mind the gap. There's a gap between your, your confession of faith and your praxis thereof. So Calvin was no different. And, and Augustine, that we'll look at tomorrow, was no different. And I'm certainly no different. I, I remind my students, hey, in case you forgot, you also have to mind your gap between your theology and your confession. And then, so this is what he continues on. He says, oh, surely there is but one way in which to achieve what is not merely difficult, but utterly against human nature. He says, okay, this thing that we're, we're about to do is against your, your, your nature. What is that? To love those who hate us, to repay their evil deeds with benefits. I don't know about you, but this is against my nature, right? I would assume that it may be against your nature too. You seem like great people, so maybe it's a little... No, I think Calvin will say it is against all of our nature, right? Because he was one of those persons who talked a lot about total depravity of humankind. It is that we remember not to consider men's evil intention. So don't think about what they're up to, or what they're really intending to do, but look, look upon the image of God in them. And notice the effect of that pivot. That turn your, turn, turn your face and look at their image of God in every human person. Because he says, which cancels and effaces, right? Cancels and effaces their transgressions. And with this beauty and dignity allures us to love and embrace that. I mean, to me, this is one of the most striking passages in Calvin's writings, I think. And we'll, have, we'll look at a few more, too. But then people who know something about Calvin or the Reformation history and theology, have often said, well, wait a minute, that sounds beautiful and wonderful, but well, how do we explain Michael Servetus' affair? I mean, you know, some of you maybe remember, uh, may remember that Michael Servetus, Servetus uh, Michel Servet, Michel Servet was a, a Spanish Catholic uh, anti-Trinitarian who basically believed that uh, he wrote a book called The Errors of the Trinity, and then he wrote another book called The Restitution of Christianity, where he basically argued that, you know, the best way to worship God is in a Unitarian model, not Trinitarian model. And he actually wanted to, he was already eradicated by the Catholic Church, and then he was hiding out in France, but then he wanted to really kind of convince Calvin and prove to Calvin that he was actually right. So uh, Michael Servetus comes to Geneva and sits in the, in, in the pew where Calvin is preaching, and people said, well, you know who's over there? That's actually Michael Servetus who's written these two books that are affirmed and, and eradicated. And so then Calvin gets involved because the civic, civic authorities had arrested him. And then he, Calvin said, okay, well, and he basically wanted him to, well, there's no way to get around it. Calvin was involved in the burning of Michael Servetus. And so we have a, a particular conflict because this passage, as we have seen earlier, this universality of the Imago Dei, ought to be also applicable to Michael Servetus. No. Is it not? And I think the answer is, 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 a, is a yes. So then, Calvin clearly failed to do that which he had told others to do. And this is a, a problem that uh, is not an insurmountable hurdle, but yet it is a hurdle. Right? And, and again, I, I'm, I'm not being kind of a, a irresponsible or cheeky when I say, yes, and minding that gap is something that we have to be really kind of be mindful of. Because the other option might be just to cancel it. Like, okay, he did this, like, we're going to cancel it. Which is altogether what is happening in a lot of our cultural context. You know, if we hear that somebody did something wrong at one time in their life journey, forget that. And, uh, and cancel him or her or them, and off we go. So I do think that, and I would love to get your feedback on this, but I think he was really committed to and concerned about at least, concerned about how to ensure that people got equitable treatment. And maybe there were some limits to your embrace. I'm not sure. So um, then the next one is, um, you know, uh, I want to quote from his commentary on Leviticus. Again, uh, I don't know when the last time it was for you to look at any commentary on Leviticus. For me, it's been a long time, right? So, and, and when I'm talking about this, I do look at this. So, he is talking about, and you probably knew this, in the Old Testament, in the Pentateuch, right? Um, there is a very, very clear kind of preference that God has toward the triumvirate of the most vulnerable in the ancient Near Eastern context. 
there are the widows and the orphans and then foreigners, right? You see what I mean? So the orphans, widows, and refugees or foreigners. And then it says, God recommends, this is what he wrote in his commentary in Leviticus chapter 19, verses 33 and 34. If someone would be willing to find Leviticus chapter 19, 33 and 34, maybe uh, somebody can read that for us. Uh, I'll, I'll read a couple of sentences. And so somebody can read, yeah, thank you, you're looking it up right there. God recommends guests and sojourners to them just as if they had been their own kindred. They then understand that equity is to be cultivated constantly and towards all men. Nor is it without cause that God interposes himself and his protection, lest injury should be done to strangers, strangers as in foreigners. Have you found it? Yes. Okay, could you read it loud and clear, please, so that people who are joining by the live stream could hear it too? Leviticus 19, verse 3, and verse 4 from the ESV version. When a stranger sojourns with you in your land, you shall not do him wrong. You shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thank you. What have we heard? So when a stranger is sojourning with you in your native land, build the wall, kick them out. No, it says, and, and it says, look, you should actually treat them as you yourself. Because what's the whole premise? One, you yourself used to be strangers, where? In Egypt. And the last part is, I am the Lord your God. I am your God. I'm telling you, this is very serious. How you treat the most vulnerable around you, the, the, the strangers and the aliens and refugees and foreigners among your communities, that's going to show your true belonging. Do you belong to this Lord your God? Because you used to be strangers yourself. That is the text. And now this is his commentary, right? Are we there? So, what our brother, and what is your name, sir? Jackson. Jackson. What our brother Jackson has read is that text of Leviticus 19, 33 and 34. And this is John Calvin's commentary on that. Right? So he says that God interposes himself and his protection, lest injury be done to foreigners or strangers. For since they have no one, notice this, they have no one who will submit to ill will in their defense. They are more exposed to the violence than various oppressions of the ungodly. Did you hear that? So if you're a foreigner, if you're not a native citizen, you're much more vulnerable. Vulnerable to the whims of those who are already, you know, citizens and power brokers and power holders. And you can probably relate to that as certainly I can. Right? You see what I mean? Like, when, when, when my family moved here to Philadelphia in 1982, December, we had nothing. We were really vulnerable, economically vulnerable, linguistically vulnerable, you know, just, just every way. I mean, existentially, we're just vulnerable people. We have some community that supported us and, you know, my aunt's family and, and the local church and so on. But it was really a precarious time. Right? And, and Calvin says, look, we, the, the poor and the, and, and, and the strangers, they're much more exposed to the violence and various oppressions of the ungodly than as if they were under the shelter of domestic securities. So you have much greater protection when you're in your own land, in most cases. But when you're in a foreign land, Calvin says, you're not. And so what I really appreciate about Calvin's commentary is like, so a lot of people who like Calvin are theologically conservative. And they also tend to be, a lot of times, politically conservative. And I said, hey, let's, let's, let's wrestle with this. They're like, oh, no, we don't want to do that. I said, oh, I mean, like you said, you love Calvin. Let's talk about this, too. Let's not actually kind of cherry pick what we want to hear. Let's actually wrestle with these things. And so I think what the whether in a PC USA context or PCA context that I've spoken in the recent past, in a couple of years, I love talking about this. And getting people to really think together according to a fellow brother who uh, loved the Lord and, and tried to love the neighbor, right? The same rule is to be observed towards widows and orphans, he says. So first, it is a stranger. And the text, as you have Jackson has read, is pertaining primarily to foreigners, yes, strangers. But now he's applying and broadening the scope of the, of the uh, interpretation and application. The text does not say anything about or widows and orphans, yes? It doesn't. 
And yet he's now including that as part of his scope of inter scopus interpretance, right? Is this the scope of the biblical text? He says, okay, it also can easily include that the same rule applies towards widows and orphans. A woman, on account of the weakness of her sex, as it was understood and experienced by many in the ancient Near Eastern context, and perhaps in the early modern period as well, is exposed to many evils unless she dwells under the shadow of a husband. Right? So she's, uh, he's basically saying, okay, in the ancient Near Eastern context when the book of Leviticus is written, a widow, a woman is going to be more secure if she's with her husband. I think that's probably true today, too. I mean, and, and vice versa. Right? I mean, like, I think I would be really, like, I wouldn't know what to do with myself if my wife suddenly left this world, you know? And, and but, but he's making a case for uh, widows here, right? And then, and many plot against orphans, many plot against orphans as if they were prey, as if they were their prey because they have none to advise them. And you know, so again, what I really appreciate about Calvin's biblical commentaries is ruthlessly honest about reality, right? If you're a foreigner, life is going to be a little harder than, you know, maybe you might say, Paul, you have no idea how tough things were in my homeland. I know things were tough in my homeland too, but he's making a general comment about, you know, the, the political and societal protection, cultural kind of ease with which you can move about, language kind of similarity and sameness. Whereas if you come to a new land, they might look at you differently based on your culture or color or country of origin, and, and you might have a hard time. And, and I have had a hard time myself. Since then, he says, they are destitute of human help. God interposes to assist them. Notice this. He says, okay, because human beings and human societies are not likely to be kind toward orphans and widows and foreigners, God says, I'm going to actually intervene. Well, then you have every reason to ask, how does God do that? And you know what Calvin's answer is? He and, you know, one of the one of the things that he talks about is the threefold office of Christ is that Christ is pro a prophet, priest, and then king. And then he's asking this question, how do we really see the kingly office of kingly reign of Christ? And he says, we see the kingly rule of Jesus most definitively and almost only in and through the church. So in the church, in your church, in my church, we have every reason to ask, how are we toward our widows and our orphans and the foreigners? And Calvin is actually willing to make this argument that in the way that you treat these the most vulnerable of the triumvirate of the communities in the ancient Near East, you are actually treating how you actually take seriously or not the divine commandments as given in the book of Leviticus. Because if they are, un so God interposes to assist them, and if they are unjustly oppressed, he declares that he will be their avenger. I mean, you know, you got to be familiar with that, like, you know, Marvel kind of comic Avengers. I mean, God is saying, I'm going to be the OG Avenger. Okay, if you actually mess about with the most vulnerable of my people, because they also bear the Imam of David within them, that the foreigners and the widows and the orphans, I'm going to be their Avenger in the way that I am called to do. So then, in other words, what would Calvin say about God's attitude toward the orphans, widows, and the strangers? We've already talked about that. Notice, as he says, in Malachi, his country in Malachi, they are under the guardianship and protection of God. Hence, everyone who plunders orphans, or harasses widows, or oppresses strangers, seems to carry on an open war, as it were with God himself. So he seems to be messing about nowhere. He says, okay, if you actually kind of, you know, um, um, treat or mistreat the most vulnerable, the, the, if you oppress strangers and, and harass widows and plunder, steal from the orphans, you're actually carrying an open war against God, who has promised that they, these, should be, these should be safe under the shadow of his hand. So again, God is in heaven, but then God actually has, um, shall we say, outsourced God's work to, to, to human beings, especially those who have their imago Dei being renewed in the imago Christi, that image of Christ, right? That means the church. That the church has an ethical and economic and theological and existential responsibility to embrace those who may be rejected by the society around. Notice what else he says. Um, he says in, 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 in this commentary on Isaiah 10, 
Um, yeah. Can someone else read Isaiah chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2? Because it's, again, what he does is, and you'd be interested to know, that these texts, so his commentary means he's actually interpreting what the text, the Bible says. And Isaiah 10, 1 and 2, this is uh, Yahweh's indictment against Israel through his mouthpiece named Isaiah about what wasn't happening and what was happening. So if you have your Bibles and if you're able to read from Isaiah chapter 10, 1 and 2, uh, that'll be great. And I often do this so that you can be staying awake and be much more solid in response and dialogically engaging together. Okay, if you have it, can you read it for us? Go to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees, to deprive the poor of their rights and withhold justice from the oppressed of my people, making widows their prey and robbing the fatherless. Thank you. Woe to those. Isaiah has said woe to those in chapter 5 five times. And in chapter 6, when he encounters the living Lord of Israel, he says, woe to me. And in, in chapter 10, he says, woe to those who make unjust laws. Right? And then plunders economically and, and making it really hard for the foreigners and the, the poor and the widows and the orphans. And this is what he says. So this is his commentary right here. God chiefly mentions the poor because for the most part, they are destitute of help and assistance. Okay, in any society, whether in South Korea or South Sudan or Southern California, if you're rich, Life is going to be okay for the most part, earthly wise. But if you're poor, oftentimes it's not. And what Calvin is, notices, watch this, friends. He is commenting on a, a, a Hebrew Bible text, a prophetic book from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Old Testament. So that means God, Yahweh, speaking through the prophet Isaiah, was excoriating and indicting the people of Israel for their laughs of justice. That you ought to be kind of protecting and protecting the poor, but you're not. And Calvin in the 16th century, so whether Isaiah is was 7th, 8th, or 9th century BCE, now in the 16th century CE or AD, Calvin is kind of saying, okay, we know that happened then, but he's also aware of the fact that this is happening in the 16th century. Now, we are talking about in 2024 in Southern California, and most of you, if not all, have some resonance or recognition that, oh, Paul Lim isn't talking about something that I have no idea what he's talking about. No, you know what I'm talking about. So Isaiah, Calvin, and ITSLA, we have that connection of what, how the poor are often treated by society and God's heart for them, right? While magistrates and judges ought to have assisted them more than others. So he says, okay, magistrates, so civil authorities, they should have actually done more to protect them they allow, in fact, however, they allow themselves greater liberty and indulge more contemptuously in oppressing them. Calvin says, okay, that's what they did. That's what we seem to do now. Those who have wealth or friends or favor are less liable to be oppressed, but they have arms, meaning weapons in their hands, to defend and even to revenge themselves. But the Lord says God takes peculiar care of the poor, even though they are commonly despised. And that the Lord takes such care of them that God does not allow oppression inflicted on them to go unpunished. For it is not without good ground that God has called himself the protector and defender of such persons. Whether a defender or avenger, says God, says comes, that's how the God of Israel is identified. That God actually takes peculiar care of those who are oppressed and the poor and the widows and the orphans because they are the ones who are most vulnerable. So then, as we think about the beauty of Reformed theology, I don't know what you came expecting to hear today. <laughs> Maybe not this. <laughs> Maybe not this. But this is so, I think, you know, for me, and as I've lectured on this in South Korea, or Oxford in England, or University of Chicago, or at a underground seminar in Vietnam where it was meeting at the top of the hotel room, like rooftop, and the, the boy was, uh, this young, like 10 year old boy was downstairs. If there was a police that came by, he would like ring the bell and we'd all hide out. All of these places, I've talked about these passages of power. Because I think it is really important, this is a natural outworking of his theological commitment to the absolute sovereignty of God 
and how the church is called and, and elected by God through Jesus in the outworking of the Holy Spirit to be called out of the world, but also called into the world, right? We're not just kind of called out as a separate, separate but also we are called to re-engage with the world in the name of this triune God. So um, what happened then? Okay, so let's look, look at some historical examples. So um, there's a, a very uh, um, prominent historian of uh, uh, early modern uh, Geneva, uh, Professor Janine Olson. She said the reformers also understood the importance of charitable institutions to meet the needs of the indigent, namely the poor, the, the, the disadvantaged, and the victims of the historical events of the time. So we talk, So basically, what we're trying to trace, and there is a uh, historian um, named uh, Professor Esther Chung Kim, who's a professor of religious studies at Claremont Academy College. Uh, um, she's written this book called Economics of Faith, and it's a brilliant book published by Oxford University Press a couple of years ago, where she talks about the economic implications of the Protestant Reformation movement. So what happened in Geneva was in 1535, the governing elites of Geneva had dissolved small hospitals for one large general hospital. So Catholic charities, right? I mean, if you go to a lot of, if you go to, maybe there are places here, like there was St. Thomas Hospital, St. St. Francis Hospital, that means that there's a Catholics have always been Western Christianity, saw that health care and spiritual care were kind of holistically connected, right? And you might have like Presbyterian Hospital or Baptist Hospital, so it is that kind of transitional moment. How did, how did Protestantism take care of the most vulnerable existentially and in actuality, right? So in 1536 to 38, that's phase one of Calvin's Geneva pastoral ministry. We mentioned that he gets forced out, and then right, he has that experience, and then he comes back in 1541 and 64, that's 23 years, the second and the final phase of his ministry. Um, he then really kind of just, he uh, has the, the committee or the, the elder board to sign on the ecclesiastical ordinances and where he kind of bolsters the power of the pastor and then, but he also creates this uh, diaconate, uh, deacons, and the diaconate was going to focus on the social and welfare agendas of the church. People who are not, I, I don't know if you have this in your churches, some of you may be Presbyterians. One of the things that I really liked about the church that uh, Dr. Chris Chun and I used to attend in Brookline, uh, Bethany Presbyterian Church, was we would have the diaconate offering once a month. That means that deacon's offering would be given, and then, and you know, and my wife and I were, and are still committed to giving a lot in the diaconate offering because what happens is special money set aside for anyone in the church. Let's say you lose your job and, and you lose, I mean, you're, you're, you know, like your family is not doing well. You have no source of income. Then what do you do? You can either go apply for something through social security, right? Or well, no. In, in Geneva, what they did was they would actually go to the church and talk to the deacons because they would have the diaconate fund. And they will say, okay, we can give you, and then let's say you were without a job for about a year. They can kind of plan out this thing. So it became a financial aid institution for the church, right? And then, so, um, four full ministerial offices, pastors, doctors, elders, and deacons, right? So then uh, the new hospital in Geneva was responsible for the city's poor. So it wasn't just about Medicare. It was also about social welfare. They were either at home or at the hospital. So the procurators, aka trustees of the city hospital, managed and ran the finances of the institution. Procurators hired a hospitaler to handle the everyday affairs of the space. And so, and number two, the influx of foreign Protestant refugees into Geneva was starting to exert serious strain on the welfare resources and system of the city. Meaning this, We've heard this before, right? Like, okay, foreigners are coming in there taking away resources. Guess what? That was also happening. People in Geneva who were native citizens were saying, yeah, and it wasn't actually a racial thing. It was actually a same religion. These are Protestant refugees coming in, but they were, so what was happening in Zurich, for example, was there were a lot of Italian, uh, um, um, Italian refugees or Protestants were coming into Zurich, and they were either doing two things, silk industry or diamond industry, right? What kind of jewelry? And they were actually, so they were, let's say they were better. And so they were taking away quite literally some of the Zurichers jobs. They were like, okay, let's get these foreigners out of here. So that seems to be a common strain throughout human civilization. You know, if you have foreigners come in, um, we don't know what they eat and how they talk and their customs, we're suspicious of them. 
And that's why I think God is very, very clear to the people of Israel. Hey, be nice to foreigners because you used to be foreigners yourself, right? So um, basically what happened was city authority was about to ex express the xenophobic tendencies. So basically what they did was, before it could be done, French, Italian, and German refugees formed their community funds. You've heard of mutual funds, right? Community. So basically, French-speaking church, okay, we're going to help a, a community fund to help start the businesses and get them off the ground. The Korean word is called ke, which is like a, a financial system that is designed to help people when, they're, when you're starting. So my parents used to belong to this thing. They were roughly people from the churches, but not always. But then 10 households, 10 couples, 10 families gathered together, and they pulled, they chip in, let's say, $1,000 a month. And you don't, but then you chip in $1,000 a month, and let's say there are 12 families, then every year you will get 12000 in a lump sum, right? You know what I'm saying? So that, that you can have with that money, like lump sum, you can start something. So it was that sort of a communal fund. So the French and Italian and German refugees formed their community funds to help the incoming refugee population. So thinking about economics of faith in this way, I think really helps us. So even the foreign funds were managed by the administrators and deacons of the fund for the poor foreigners, right? And then, um, so this is what happened in, in Geneva. 1545, so Calvin is back in, in his uh, pastoral ministry context, was sort of the breaking point in Geneva. The eviction of these refugees was very imminent, and there is a French refugee in Geneva named David Busanto. Uh, he, in his deathbed, bequeathed to Calvin a huge sum of money to be specifically used for founding a hospital for the French refugees. So think about like, okay, there's a special hospital for the, uh, you know, African immigrants or, you know, Latin American immigrants, right? And that, that's what they ended up doing, okay? We, uh, the, the, the regular hospital is not allowing us to come. We need some Medicare. We're going to find a different hospital. And that's what they ended up doing. That was uh, sort of the birth of this kind of a, a Bourse Francais or French purse, French fund. Once again, it was followed by the Italian fund, the German fund, the English fund, all designed to lend financial and emotional and social assistance to the religious refugees. Calvin was a severe man in many ways, and his friends, some of them like uh, feared him, some of them revered him, and everyone took him seriously. But he also happened to be, so he was certainly a person of clay feet, a uh, person of fault. But he also was the most generous individual donor to be on the work of this diaconate ministry. He felt like, okay, refugees coming into our city, they need that financial assistance as well as spiritual assistance for us to really be the kind of manifestation of the kingdom of Christ here on earth. So I think with that, I'm going to probably stop because it's almost an hour into our time. So my apologies for having gone over for my excitement to talk about these things, but I'm going to stop right now and then open ourselves up for some um, conversation, question and answer. So thank you very much. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for this. This message we really need. And uh, thank you here in America. Yeah. And, uh, you see, we are a pretty good international group here. Yep. Only a few, uh, a few of us that are Native Americans. Yes. And uh, only a few of us are Native Americans. Yeah. Uh, but we got a, we got a, a, a crisis. I think in the, in the evangelical churches. Yes. Yeah. Like yes. And to identify with. Yes. Uh, uh, Christian nationalism. Yes. Yeah. And uh, I personally have a lot of problems with that because yes, I don't I do to be very Christian. Right. It's nationalist, but it's not very Christian. Right. Do you have any guidance as to how to, how to guide us as, as Americans welcoming our students yeah. and welcoming you know, the border? And then yeah. the, the city of Los Angeles is typical, most cities in America now, where until recently, the homeless you see them in one section of the town yes. on the streets. Now they're everywhere. Yes. And and uh, it's a big problem. Yeah. And what are we doing about it? Any guidance for us? 
Yeah, no, thank you, uh, first of all, for uh, raising that obvious kind of issue of Christian nationalism. Um, I would say this, in my experience, a lot of churches that kind of like someone like John Calvin, uh, and they also happen to be Christian nationalists, I always want to go back and say, hey, let's talk about this. I, um, I've spoken to a lot of churches, uh, both within Nashville and beyond, but especially in Nashville, uh, ranging from mainline Presbyterian, mainline Protestants to Catholics to, you know, evangelicals, especially in the evangelical spaces where they self-identify either as Reformed Baptist or Reformed. <laughs> Calvin is not a small name. So what I often do is really kind of bring up these, these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, texts that I have given this presentation in its different uh, manifestations multiple times. And because my aim is like, okay, what comes first? You know, the Apostle Paul. So a lot of Christian nationalists take the New Testament especially very seriously, right? Pauline epistles especially. Right, well then let's, let's look at Philippians chapter 3. Paul reminds the Philippians that our citizenship is in Rome. Yes. No. Our citizenship is in where? In heaven. <laughs> That means that more than anything else, the Apostle Paul was a Roman citizen. He says, okay, there's something that transcends my national identity that comes before anything else is my primary and, and ultimate identity is that I belong to the gracious Lord who has given himself up for me in Jesus Christ. And now he has given me, opened my eyes, my vista of my vision of life has been wide open to see that it's not the national, national identity, not the imperial identity of Rome that matter to me the most. It is actually going to be the fact that we are citizens of the same kingdom that transcended there. So I think I, I have, I mean, I don't know how effective I've been, but but I, I've always kind of talked about that and talk about it still. And some people, I think most people are genuinely surprised that Calvin talked about stuff like this. Because when you hear Calvin, I think you used to think of Taylor. Right? You know, like total depravity, un unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. And most people don't even know what that means. But then they certainly have never encountered anything like this from Calvin. So I think I, I feel like as a co-learner and as well as a teacher, my task, you know, I'm in my middle 50s now, and I've been doing this for about quarter century, my job is to really open up the vista of things that they haven't seen before that's actually been there all along. So there is a legacy and, and within the reform tradition that talks about, you know, thinking of the Reformation as a refugee movement to me is big. And it is, it was. And to think about the kind of um, how we ought to think about the issues of immigration, transnationalism, and all of that is really right there. So thank you for bringing that up. And that's what I have said. And my, my advice is, especially in the conservative context, and many Christian nationalist congregations or individuals tend to be politically conservative and also religiously conservative. So kind of bring that up as been. Oh, yes, here and then. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have a question. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> whoever has the mic. Whoever has the mic. I'm not going to decide as to which speaks. You all kind of, I mean, maybe someone can be a moderator. Yeah. Yes, he has the mic. Yes, yeah. I have the mic. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Uh, thank you so very much, Professor, for, for uh, the very good presentation. Thank you. Uh, there is this what we call the oppressive game of oppressor. And the, most of us from developing countries are here from Tanzania. Mm -hmm. Are you from Tanzania? Yes, Tanzania. Yes. Dar es Salaam? Dar es Salaam. Okay, all right. Okay. Do you know Calvin Theological Seminary in Dar es Salaam? No. <laughs> so, uh, I was talking about the oppressed became the oppressor. Yeah. Most of us who are coming from this developing country, the colonialism, colonialist, they use religion to oppress us. Yes. And uh, you can see the resulting of this everywhere in our society. Our leader also became oppressor. Yeah. They are, they are, it's like a vicious cycle. Well, they are doing the same thing that the colonialists they used to do. You can see also in the church. Oh, yeah. You see, it's also in the church, it's also the label of the family everywhere. And then, as a pastor, we came and tried to tell people that love some 
thousand love thy neighbor. Yes. But you are telling the people who have a lot of pain and it's like they are they are putting the same pain to other people. Mm -hmm. And in your presentation here, that you're in a place where it's like teaching us how we can help these people who were oppressed and now they are oppressed the other, how they can heal and bring different results. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I really want to hear from you that aspect. Thank you so much. Okay. That got an applause. That was a great point. I think there was a was there a question there? I mean, I thought there was a very passionate comment. Which is fine. I mean, like this is the security. He was asking about transitioning. How do you transition when you have local people now in charge, but they're repeating the pattern? Yeah, yeah. How do you address that? Right, right, right. I was being somewhat facetious, but thank you for clarifying that too. Yeah, I think that is the real. Yeah, yesterday's oppressed becomes today's oppressed. Right? Mm -hmm. that exactly. Be, I mean, that's why God says to the people of Israel, don't do that, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but that's why God has to remind them, hey, you used to be, you know, enslaved. Yeah. Now don't go around enslaving other people. Don't forget the most vulnerable among you. Mm -hmm. So, okay, my, my answer is very simple. Um, and that is, yes, but go back to the text. Let's go back to the text given by the Almighty and All-Merciful and All-Glorious and All-Gracious God. He reminds the people of God, both in the Old Testament that we have looked at, but also in James chapter 2. You know how James chapter 2 begins? I'm surprised. James <laughs> chapter 2 begins by saying there should be no it's an F word, favoritism in the church. Why do you think James said there should be no favoritism in the church? Because there was. <laughs> there was favoritism. And, and look at James chapter 2. I mean, it says that when a rich person comes into your assembly, you say, come on over here. Please sit in you know, a nice place. When a poor person walks in, you say, sit at my feet. Right. So we're talking about the, the, the first century church. Right. So in the first century context, there was also this discriminatory practice. I mean, people say, I've heard so many say, if I can only, if, if only I can go back and live in the first century church. I say, oh, which one are we talking about? The Corinthian church or the church that James is writing about? Or, you know what I mean? So it seems that there is a real kind of almost incurable human tendency. I said almost incurable because God can heal and God is healing. But, so God needs to remind us through the Holy Spirit as to, hey, let's look at this text, whether it's in Isaiah chapter 10 or Malachi or Leviticus 19 or James chapter 2. That human communities, whether in the Old or New Testament, Israel or the church, we have a tendency to forget what we have heard. I have a tendency to forget what I've heard. You know, I, I look at our dog, his name is Baxter, and it's... Uh, <laughs> Not Richard Baxter, Baxter, it's kind of a funny story. He's a six-year-old multi when we, when we went to pick him up from the breeder, I asked the, 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 the breeder, the guy who breeds dogs, I said, hey, does this puppy, and it was like six weeks old puppy, I said, does this puppy have a name? And the guy said, yeah, I named him Baxter. I said, Baxter? And I asked him, have you ever named any of your puppies Baxter? He's like, no, it's first one. I said, you know what? I did my PhD work on someone named Baxter. <laughs> Whatever, take the dog, baby, and mom. <laughs> Every time I look at my dog Baxter, one thing that he's really good at is forget everything. I seem to be like, look at my dog Baxter and say, you know, I see myself. I so quickly forget the things that I read in the morning as part of my morning devotion or lecture divina or whatever. That it is that amnesia that we all suffer from. That I need to be reminded daily, if not hourly, of who God is and to whom we belong. If I really belong to this sovereign and merciful God who says, you know what, is based upon the image of God in all human persons, that you have to actually have this kind of commitment to the fundamental rights of humankind. It is not some kind of UN statement of you know, human rights, it is actually writ large in the creation mandate. How God calls us to Himself, God creates us for His glory 
and calls us to be covenant partners in the restoration project mm -hmm. and completing the, the, this project called creation. And I think we all ought to be better remembering that. So it is, we suffer from the amnesia every day. So I, need, I think we need to go back to the text of scripture. That will remind us that, yes, yesterday's oppressed becomes so easily today's oppressed. So how do we cut that Gordian, cut through the Gordian knot? Is by going to the text and say, you used to be enslaved. Do not go around this day because I will lose you Thank you for that question. And, okay, well, Mike is going around. Because so. <laughs> a lot of times when I see somewhere, somebody gets upset, like, I didn't get to ask this question. So from that moment, I'll figure out who's speaking. So, go ahead. My question has been partially answered. Okay. Because it was connected. Yep. I want to thank you so much for opening my and understand my eyes to see an aspect of uh, how they speak mm -hmm. that I didn't know. Yeah. Really, I was a familiar. <laughs> right, sure. And uh, the thing is, I'm listening to you and wondering, this um, this is so profound, so stands out so much. Why is it not an element? Why is it not uh, something that stands out with yeah. within? The church so, and the uh, and for example as he said in, in Kenya the reformed church was brought by the boss from colonials yes. who are boss from South Africa. Yes. And as far as I know that, that because of that yeah. they oppressed all as all well and everything so nobody very few Kenyans follow the reformed tradition. Very few Yeah sure. Yes. Sure. And what happened along the way that this became was left in the background? Yes. And all we hear about is predestination. And of mm -hmm. course, yeah, there are some people are predestined to be bowlers. You know, there's a thank you for that, uh, Doctor. And I, I think there's a, I forgot who, but there's a very, very tragically funny story about the exchange that took place between Western missionaries and Africans. People. They came over and we prayed together. After we prayed together, we had our Bibles in our hands and they had our bed. <laughs> and then I, I think, you know, so as a as a committed Christian, and I mean like five point Calvinist kind of Christian that I am, I think we have done some terrible things in the name of God. And I'm not just talking about white people, I'm talking about black people, I'm talking about Asian people, it depends, like everybody. Like and then and also, at the same time, we have done some terrific things in the name of God. Right? So I think a lot of people who are progressives or kind of about to be atheist type, they see nothing but pernicious evil that the church has done. And the Christian National Super Conservatives, they see nothing wrong, nothing wrong whatsoever that the church has ever you know, perpetrated in the name of the triune God. And I think the truth that lies in the middle. You see what I mean? Like as the as one of the few evangelical Christians teaching at Vanderbilt Divinity School, uh, it's like two out evangelicals are by myself and I don't want to out the other brother because it's being live stream, but, but there are two of us, right? And then but we try to be we realize that the reason why some people are no longer Christians is because they have seen Christian nationalists or something like that, or that kind of evil perpetrated in different parts of the world, but or in America. And they're like, I don't want anything to do with Christianity. Because it's only that. Well, I think the response should be, thank you for pointing that out. Thank you. We want to repent with you. And we want to say I'm sorry. But also, I want you to kind of come and meet Jesus. Because I think I have, and I think you all do too, have the confidence that Jesus is better than you and me, all put together. That following Jesus means that he was living in a he was um, he was living among the oppressed community, yes? Yes. I mean, when Jesus was living, the Roman Empire had the power. You know how Jesus died, of course, yes? He was crucified. You know, another way of putting that is he was executed as a public criminal. Did you know that? Yes, of course you knew that. That means the Roman Empire was saying, we're going to show you who is in charge. We're going to show you who is boss. If you are God, and if you're going to send your one and only eternal son of God, your son, to this earth, would you make sure that he dies that way as a publicly executed criminal? And yet God, in God's infallible right wisdom, infinite wisdom, 
has predestined that his son would go through that pathway of death. Why is that? I think more than anything else, it really shows that Jesus took the wrath of God upon himself, but also another way of looking at it is, this is a, the conservative part. The progressive part will say, it shows the solidarity of God in Jesus Christ with the most vulnerable. And I say amen to both. I think in my middle 50s, I realize that there are some wonderful things that conservatives have said. There are some wonderful things that progressives have said. And the two parties, they don't talk to each other. Like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm going to cancel you. And it happens among both sides. And I really think that there are some things that I, I can learn from both. So I taught for five years at Gordon Conwell Seminary, which is an evangelical school uh, in Boston. And then the last 18 years at Vanderbilt, which is a very progressive school. And I'm not here to demonize or denigrate either one. I'm like, yeah, no, I've, I've learned a lot from both these entities. And I, I am thankful to God because I do think that they're, and so I do think that the kind of, um, the critique that is often leveled at the, the, the reform tradition, and no wonder there are that many Christians in the reform Christians in Kenya because, yeah, I think so. But I'm not necessarily here as a like, like a spokesperson for reformed theology, although I'm giving them Joseph Tolkien lectures in reformed theology. But I am here to give a, a, be the spokesperson for the triune God, which manifests himself most clearly in the life and death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, which reality becomes more real in the Holy Spirit. So, thank you. Whoever has the mic next is. Can you pass it? Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you so much, Paul. Um, I'm really so grateful for how you captivated my very objective about the subject of the reform theology. I have a lot of questions, but I'll ask just a few. I think two to the three signs. So, can you remove the mask at least to get here? So, Orix, you can. Okay, put the mic here. Oh, let me try to talk a little louder. So I all I heard is you have a few questions and you're going to reduce them to a couple or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm using it to my ear. Is that loud enough? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, first of all, I said that I'm so grateful for the fact that you're passionate but very objective about you know, the subject of reformed theology. And that's really encouraging. So I wanted to ask a few things. Um, mm -hmm. First of all, in your extensive study of Calvin and Calvinism, have you ever come across a teaching? It was obvious you stated that there are certain practices of his theology that you didn't really match up with whatever you thought, yeah. like the value of uh, yeah. that Michael guy. So, is there some teaching of Calvin that you don't agree with, let alone his practices? Mm. Um, that's one. And then yeah. the other thing I was <laughs> looking forward to hearing you talk about. Uh, to you? Yes. Um, as most specifically about the subject of freedom and atonement. Mm. Um, yeah, that's been one other big thing. And maybe lastly, don't you think that Calvin's appeal to um, the protection of the foreigners and by extension to, to widows and orphans, the vulnerable in the yes. society, do you feel that he was making an appeal by extension to himself? He was a foreigner in Geneva. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, feel that's a little selfish, don't you think? These are three wonderful and very important questions uh, that could basically take up the rest of our q and time, which I think I'm, I'm happy to do. And let's get going then, shall we? So uh, to, the, to the easiest one first, the last one. You rightly tried Calvin of you. Isn't that a little bit self serving because he himself was a refugee and he's saying, well, you see, you should, you should, he wrote a lot of time talking about how he should be nice to people of foreigners and widows and orphans. Yes, I would agree with you. Um, I don't know why his life circumstances did not make it otherwise that, you know, that he becomes a refugee and then he kind of, you know, let's be honest. I mean, for me, as a as an immigrant to the United States as a little teenager when I was 15, when I first heard that the Protestant Reformation the refugee movement, it really warmed my heart strangely to borrow the Wesleyan language. I was like, yeah, this is awesome. 
And when I heard of John Calvin, because I, I I'd only heard of Calvin as a terrible, like, tulip, kind of, like, you know, whatever, predestination guy. When I heard that he was a refugee, I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Right? So, no. Um, so you're saying that, isn't that a little bit self-serving? Perhaps. I think you, you may be right. But, but could it also be that because he was a refugee himself, that he was more sensitive to these aspects of the biblical teaching? Right? Because the stuff that we heard today were his comments from the biblical text. You see what I mean? Meaning that these things that God says, be nice to the foreigners and the widows and the orphans, Calvin didn't make it up. It's the biblical teaching from Leviticus and Malachi and Isaiah and so on that becomes the bedrock foundation of his kind of social ethic. You see what I'm saying? So I think, but but I, I've i heard that a lot. And and then to the, the central question about limited atonement. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, um, so I I want to put it to you this way uh, that in my in my interpretation in my appropriation of that teaching. So, um, so I went to a seminary, a small seminary in Philadelphia, called Biblical Seminary, and and a neighboring seminary is called Westminster Seminary. And I was an English ministry pastor of this large Korean church. And I would have people, and this is when I was younger in my 20s, and deeply insecure that I was. And I wanted to sound so Calvinist and so Augustinian because I knew that people from Westminster Seminary, like seminaries, would come and listen to it. They'll find faults with my teaching. <laughs> they would tell me that themselves, and they would tell their friends that. And so I, there was a time in my life journey where I wanted to be more Calvinist than Calvin himself <coughs> because I had kind of proved to them that I'm actually worth listening to. Um, I am halfway through my life, for sure, I'm 56. I don't think I'll be living until I'm 412. <laughs> that means I'm certainly past my half-life. I became a little less concerned about, although the irony is that today I'm talking about Calvin, tomorrow I'm talking about Boston, two figures who have shaped me more than anyone else, two people. But I, the, the teaching of limited atonement, this is how I have interpreted and some have done so as well. That it is that the death of Jesus is efficacious, right? Uh, potentially efficacious to save this world many times over. So potential is there, but in actuality, in actuality, it is limited to those who are already known by God and elected in Christ. Right? But this is how I will also talk about predestination or election. As Paul makes it very clear in Ephesians chapter one. And Calvin talks about this a lot too. And Calvin talks about it in his institute somewhere that, you know what, if you actually try to look for the causes and the effects of your election outside of Christ, you're gonna find this whole thing to be a major labyrinth or maze, M-A-Z-E, right? But, so you need to make sure that Christ is the mirror upon whom you contemplate your own election. Paul says in Ephesians chapter one that you are chosen in Christ. Right? So that, that language, that prepositional language of being in Christ becomes that, that he is the one who actually will assuage my own anxieties about whether I'm chosen or not. This is what I said. You know what? Uh, one of the things about the about the folk that I was in there that I like is, as a Russell said, we are, we are called to give people the benefit of the doubt. If somebody says I'm a Christian, unless proven otherwise, I have I I I obliged to believe her or him and their testimony. You see what I'm saying? So, um, and I I how do I know if anyone's saved? See, I have no business. I used to do that when I was younger. I used to think in my head like, she's saved, he's dead, he's dead, he's saved, she's dead, he's saved, she's dead, he's saved, she's saved. I used to go around thinking like, and I, I, I mean, I never actually said it to anybody, but I knew in my heart. I knew in my heart. Then I realized later on in my career, when I was just starting to teach, you know what? Salvation, as 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 Book uh, of Jonah says, salvation belongs to what? The Lord. The Lord knows. Those who are His. I have no business in going around in my heart, secret of you know, secret recess in my heart, saying, I know that she's saved, that he's not. I have no idea way to know. Then I have really then judgment of charity. I ought to judge if they say something 
and I ought to judge charitably their testimony and hoping and praying that they will come to have the same knowledge of God. So to me, the practical outworking of Hewlett is very much, you know, like I think it is much softer than this hardcore predestinary. If people ask me, are you reformed? I would say unequivocally I am. Now, some of my equivalents say, you're not actually reformed because you're actually a nice guy. I'm like, okay, that's great. <laughs> because I think a lot of criticisms that I've heard from you know, those who are not reformed who say reformed people are so completely certain and arrogant about their theology. And I say, you know what? If, since salvation belongs to the Lord, I want to, you know, like do everything I can to make the gospel call and, and invite people to have a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And, uh, and it is your, your choice, yes, but is it God's choice? Yes. And I leave that mystery up to God. I hope that's uh, helpful rather than... Um, so. All right. Um, we have time for one more. One more, okay. So one more. We, yes, have a, yeah. we have a question from online. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Dr. Eddie wants to talk. Okay, so we have here and then online. Okay, okay. Yeah. so go ahead, please. Yeah. Pastor Eddie. You're, I think your mic is coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for your presentation. Thank you. What is your view on nationalism? Well, we, that was the first question. As you remember, what was my view of Christian nationalism, as um, this gentleman has asked? And I said that, as you said it so well, it is more nationalist and less Christian. And I tend to find that to be a generally helpful generalization. And I think so. And, and so I, I mentioned Philippians chapter 3. Yeah, and, and the follow-up Yep. Yeah. Yeah. What was Calvin's view on that? Right? Sure. So that's, that's a great question. So I don't think he knew something like Christian nationalism. I think he, um, so, and this is uh, before the emergence of these nation states, there are certain empires, right, that, that had existed before. And I think he held to, I think, and back to your question, like, because he himself was a refugee, I think he held to this kind of national identity much more loosely than we do today, right? Because he was a French national. But he lived, so he wasn't given the Geneva citizenship until five years before he died. So he's arguably one of those powerful persons who was non-citizen in Geneva. So I think his idea of national identity or citizenship, shall we say, or citizenship is probably a, a better way to think about that, is, is that, that he really, because his life was as a, um, what is it, that um, free card holder. You know, when, when we first came to America, we got a card that says, you are what? Resident, what? Well, alien. alien. I'm like, alien. Like, people in the movie are like aliens. So I'm like, I have a possibility. But then, there are strangers and aliens in this world. So, you know what I often tell my friends who are, you know, as you said, nativists? I said, listen, if you ever, if you never see yourself as a stranger and alien in this world, you really need to check whether you're a Christian or not. I mean, seriously, because I think the Bible is abundantly clear. This world is not your home, right? Jesus said, you are in but not of the world. So I do think that, and this is a real challenge for me. You know, do I really, and A.W. Tozer, a, a, a preacher who I really appreciate a lot, he said, the reason why we don't preach about, you know, the heaven that much is because many of us have a very comfortable life here. <laughs> so why trade away something that we know for sure for something we know very little about? You see what I mean? And, and I, I do think that, and, and I find myself deeply convicted when I, when I do that. And where's my wife? So I really married up in my life. My wife is much more pious than me. She really has a deep desire for heaven. And she really convicts me and says, Paul, don't you, like, if you say you love Jesus, don't you want to be with Jesus? <laughs> I said, yeah, and this is how I, she convicts me. So our son is in college in, in Palo Alto, California. And from Nashville, that's about 1,952 miles away. I yearn to be with my son. If I'm going to be in California, I'd rather be in Palo Alto than West Covina, to be honest with you, but I'm here to go over. But, and Nikki, my wife said, you know what? You say you, you love Jesus. And she says, do you love Jesus more than your son? 
Lord, do you love our son Christian more than Jesus? And I said, of course I love Jesus more. And she says, it's not all that clear to me every day. <laughs> so whether, I mean, so I would say, sir, that, that Christian nationalism is a thing. It is a thing around. And I think Calvin would say that our citizenship really is in heaven. It's partly because of his existential context was that he was not a citizen of a nation. So nation states were being developed in this case. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say. And thank you for that. And we have an on online question. Yeah, I think this would be the last one. Okay, so... thank you for determining that for us. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? So, I need some lunch. so we have a... We have our alumni whose name is Fitzsum and he has some questions. First of all, he thank you for the great lecture. And uh, you mentioned about the contradiction between what John Calvin said and what happened to Michael Cervantes. Yes. And we know it. We know in history how part headed was uh, supported by Dutch Reformed Church. Yep. It is already mentioned that the relationship of colonizers, uh, colonizers and West, uh, Western ministers, uh, min missionaries, and now the postmodern society in the West is facing overwhelming migration. And there is a lot anti-migration and sentiments among churches. I am just wondering if you have anything to more to say, mind the gap, uh, especially in relation with the current situation. Why is there such a profound contradiction between such wonderful biblical theological understanding and the dark sides of its practice in Reformed theology? I'll just say a loud amen to everything that was. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, I do really think that Tony Campolo is someone that I've appreciated over the years. Our books may not always here together, but he was preaching somewhere and he said, you know what, if you knew everything about me, you would be sitting there listening to me. Then he said, don't get up yet because if I knew everything about you, I would not have come from where I was to come and speak to you. Meaning that God, God's love for us is covenantal and omniscient love. God knows everything about us, right? We don't know everything about God. We actually know partially and see through the glass darkly. And I think as our alum mentioned, yeah, I think when you think about the fact that it was the Dutch Reformed Church in South Africa, the, you know, that really kind of came up with and using Calvin's theology to support those who are elect, namely the white, you know, Africans, and then those who are not elect would be the, the indigenous uh, black uh, South Africans. And I think that, that, and you can multiply those examples. Um, so should, should we therefore stop believing in, in Christianity is the question of the day. I, I think it is the question that has come up from people who are in ministry, who I think you would probably self-identify as reform slash evangelical and so on. And I, I think that is the, the, the burden of Christianity in 21st century global context. And I, I, I learn a lot more when I go, whether to prison, or to Vietnam, or to Poland, or to Tanzania, or Kenya, or Ethiopia, because you know, in in these uh, parts of the world where Christianity is not like the majority content, like it really is to me uh, eye-opening and convicting to learn about the past legacies of Christianity and how we can we can seek to not replicate the mistakes, although you know. We may be replicating what we say. So I, I think, you know, when, when um, Dr. Lee invited me to come and um, give these lectures, I was first of all really humbled and honored, but also really excited to engage in conversations about this sort. From, because I get these questions asked at Vanderbilt too. But then the difference is, I think you're wanting to do something constructively about it so that you can continue to beautify the church. Whereas some similar questions are raised by some at, at, in my home context where they said, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not a believer anymore because of it. Mm. And so I think it, it raises the, the ante or the stake a little bit higher. Um, well, I think that's about all I've got to say for today. And thank you very much for your kindness. And Yes, we did.
we want to say a big thank you to our speaker this morning afternoon and also a hand clap to the Lord. It's a bit refreshing for you, for us to sit. Sorry. Is it it refreshing for you to sit here and listen to such profound teaching for a change? I'm, I'm refreshed. Thank you. And tomorrow we'll have uh, Dr. Ruben again at 11.30. Let's be here before 11.30. His topic tomorrow will be communion with Christ for contemporary spirituality. What the Reformed tradition can offer. I'm looking forward to that. And, um, all right, that's the end of our session for today. And see you tomorrow. And let's make sure our guests get lunch first. Yeah. All our guests first and then the rest of us take <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. Just wanted to recognize, um, so thank you for coming. I guess it's, yeah, just uh, for those people who are here. So we have some special guests here. We have uh, Professor Chris Chan from Gateway Seminary. Uh, he is with us, so thank you, Dr. Chan, for coming and uh, being present here. But once again, thank you for everyone. And uh, we have a delicious meal prepared for those people who are here in person, but once again, thank you for all the people who are joining online and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you. Let's pray for the lunch. 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 I want you to be a Tomorrow, when the audience was there, people come in the first thing we try to go be a QA tomorrow. If you would like to participate in that, please type in the chat and get to it. Yeah. Like at the very beginning. So that everyone can see it. Yeah, yeah. 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 The only thing is that I can see it. Oh, yeah. Please feel free to end, end the stream. Oh, not end all, but just, um, where's the more? Oh, here, here, here. More. And then... Oh, did we stop recording? Oh, we stopped already, right? No. There we go. Stop. Stop the stream. Yeah, stop the stream. We weren't recording, though.